Дамы и господа, президент Российской Федерации Владимир Владимирович Путин. Tanks, warplanes, battleships, brinksmanship, and water. Does it all add up to a new crisis around the occupied Crimean Peninsula? Today, we'll take a close look at rising tensions between Moscow and Kyiv and the rising temperature in the broader Black Sea region, as Russia gears up for major military exercises in just a couple of months. And we will do so with two special guests who know a thing or two about Black Sea security. Hello from my makeshift studio in my condo in Washington, D.C.'s funky Adams Morgan neighborhood, and welcome to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program here at SEPA. And joining me from his hotel room in downtown Washington is retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, a 37-year veteran of the United States Army, the former commander of U.S. Army Europe, and currently the Persian Chair in Strategic Studies here at SEPA. Welcome back to Washington, and welcome back to the podcast, Ben. Thanks, Brian. I'm very happy to be here. Very happy to have you. And also with us from an undisclosed location in Virginia, where he is hiding out with his two dogs, Ivan the Kogi and Finn the Collie, is military analyst Michael Kaufman, director of Russian studies at the CNA Corporation and a fellow at the Kennan Institute. Welcome back, Michael. Good to see you again. And big hello to Ivan and Finn. Thanks. Good to see you. I missed you guys. <laughs> yeah, miss, miss, we, miss, we missed you too. Um, so just in case we all don't have enough to like keep us up at night these days, let's consider the following. Um, Russian-occupied Crimea is suffering from a very severe water shortage. In fact, all of Ukraine is suffering from, from a water short, shortage. And Ukraine has cut off access to the North Crimean Canal, which provides 85% of the peninsula's clean water, a move that has led to fresh tensions with Moscow. Ukraine says it would be happy to open the canal once Russia ends its occupation. Meanwhile, Russia continues to deploy new troops in Crimea and along the Ukrainian border. In total, 87,000 military personnel with 4,000 armored vehicles and tanks, 1,500 artillery pieces and rocket systems, and 560 military planes and helicopters are now deployed around Ukraine, according to Ukrainian media, citing the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. Russia's Black Sea fleet has become increasingly active in the Black Sea, conducting exercising and, move, and moving submarines through the Bosporus. So, and uh, oh, by the way, those Kafka's 2020 military exercises are scheduled for September. Ben, I am sure I missed something here, so feel free to uh, chastise, chastise me and point out any notable omissions. But I know you're concerned about all of this. We've been talking quite a bit about this off mic for the past couple of weeks now. What are you worried about and what can NATO do to address this issue? Brian, thanks. Um, and great to be with you and Michael. Uh, what I'm worried about is that the West uh, and the, including the United States, uh, are not paying attention to the uh, coming confluence of several conditions that I think significantly increase the potential of a much bolder move by the Kremlin to take more and more control of Ukraine, specifically the part of Ukraine that touches the Black Sea, all the way from Transnistria to, uh, of course, they would like to connect all the way to Abkhazia and the other part of Georgia that's occupied by Russian forces. Uh, this drought that's uh, causing uh, problems in Crimea, of course, is partly driven by the weather, but that's why you have a canal that connects the uh, Dnieper River to the peninsula. This canal is about 400 kilometers long, uh, but there's a dam across this canal up near uh, Novokakovka, um, that was put in place by the Ukrainians back in 2014 after Russia seized Crimea. Um, so you hear the information, the disinformation operations by the Russians talking about this humanitarian crisis. And of course, uh, Russia has always said it's their duty to protect all Russians wherever they are that were left behind after the end of the Cold War. And so you can kind of sense that they're, they're building the pretext that they might have to do something to alleviate this humanitarian crisis, which is entirely of their own doing, by the way, because of their illegal annexation. And you have the exercise Kavkaz 2020 take, scheduled to take place in September. Um, you've got a 
set of circumstances where the United States is distracted by our own coming elections in the fall. Uh, and clearly Germany and France have not shown much uh, interest in seriously uh, pressing the Kremlin to live up to its agreements. So I think that it, it's a, the conditions could be in place for Russia to take steps um, to take control of more territory under the pretext of a humanitarian crisis. And I, I would add to that, we're, we're seeing increased activity in the Black Sea. I mean, the Russians have been, just this, this week, the Russian Defense Ministry claimed it intercepted three U.S. military aircraft in, in the Black Sea. There have been reports of, of Russian submarines in violations of the Montreux Convention going through the Bosporus. Um, the, uh, the famous uh, the Turkish ship spotter on Twitter, whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, um, was, has, has been tweeting about this fair, fairly actively. Um, and, and you see a, a lot of increased activity there. Michael, when we look at this, now I, you always got to try, we're all responsible kind of uh, analysts here. We're trying to, we, we don't want to be too alarmist on one hand, right? We don't want to, you know, be worried about our precious bodily fluids and seeing, seeing Russians under every bed. Um, but on the other hand, we don't want to be Pollyannish and get caught off guard. And I'm, I'm counting on you to kind of bring a lot of balance and realism into this, into this discussion about this, because I'm, I'm always struggling with where I should be on this. Should I, you know, am I being too Pollyannish or am I being too alarmist? I usually err toward being too alarmist. Anybody that knows me would, would, would say that. But well, how do you see this, Michael? Um, probably being a bit too alarmist, but... Um you're right, I'm a bit of a conservative analyst, right? So unless I see data that really, really changes my mind, I probably lean more towards the nose. But I'd like to take Ben's points on boards, right? Not just because we're good colleagues and friends, but also because I think there's always room to be vigilant. Um, at the end of the day, Russia has the capability around Ukraine to execute a fairly short notice offensive and achieve conventional overmatch fairly quickly, in my opinion. And when the capability is there, you have to accept that intentions can always change and you have to hedge against that uncertainty, right? So I think it is always good to red team things and to talk about it, even if you do find yourself sometimes talking about the same proposition each year, because it's very, it's certainly not the first year I've heard the proposal that Russia might invade from Crimea to take the Dnieper Canal, to take some part of Kherson or attain the land bridge to uh, Crimea. From Russia proper, I mean, I have to be honest, I think I've, I've in some ways, I've heard this proposition almost you every You had year. an excellent blog post uh, back in 2018 on this that I read. Yeah, December 2018, that's the last good time I heard, I heard this thesis, and I always have to ask myself, okay, well, what's different, and why would I change my mind based on what I wrote on 2018? So I think it's, it's definitely worth discussion, discussing. So um, the, the base problems with the operation remain, right? If you're coming from Crimea, you have to take the entire canal. Otherwise, it can be blocked by the Ukrainians at any point further up, all the way up to the Dnieper River. So you really have to push into a pretty large area to do it. You got to grab like all 70 kilometers to get to the river to take the whole canal because without the operations points. Um, okay. The challenge with the operations has always been twofold. One, first, it gets you lots of new problems. It's only easy to take territory on a map, right? But states are full of integrated pieces, so if you take that large piece of your sun, suddenly, before you know it, you need electricity, water, road networks, food supplies, commerce, trade, for whatever was feeding that region. And you don't know that it's at all autarkic. You have no idea, right? So good chances you might end up, how did you end up with a water problem and initially the electricity problem in Crimea in, to begin with? All that came from mainland Ukraine, right? This is exactly what happens when you try to take a piece of a region. Um, and in, in political terms, it you'd have a hard time explaining it. Ben might have a good point that, look, there's this, there's this humanitarian crisis. I think two things are true. One, there have been plenty of acute water shortages in Crimea since 2014. And the last big one was probably summer of 28, okay? Two, Crimea generally has enough water from the, for the population, but did not have enough for agriculture, right? And all the agriculture production they were engaged in. My understanding is that this one's pretty bad, but since February, they've had to do water rationing, in the main city in Sifferopol, that this one probably hits that point where there's not enough water for the population. But I don't honestly know if it's that extreme or dire. Um, and, and Ben, uh, I think Ben is welcome to chime in on that. Um, but I have to tell you, in my view, at least the political appetite uh, certainly shouldn't be there. Um, and it's going to be pretty hard to explain the required conquest of Kherson. And the truth is, if you're going to push out that much, you might as well uh, Take, take that entire southeastern strip of Ukraine. And even if you don't, it's still a pretty massive operation to begin with manpower-wise. 
Um, and it'd be a tough explanation as to what it is that's sacred for Russia in Kherson Oblast uh, uh, that Russia, the Russia had to take it and de facto occupy and annex it. But Brian, as you do know the old joke, while most countries have an unpredictable future, Russia's a country with an unpredictable past. <laughs> 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 Everything is possible. <laughs> No, yeah, this, I think it's true. Uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to talk more, but I'd, I'd like to maybe let Ben. Yeah, no, I know. I want to. Ben, Ben, Ben wants to get in here, and I'm just like the thing I keep thinking of. You rose. You you raised this point, Michael, in your in your excellent blog post. And this is like, when do these just data? A bunch of data points don't necessarily add up to a pattern. And we're looking at these data points and looking at them like you know, from 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 ten thousand feet, they look scary. Um, you're, you're zeroing in on, on the data points and, and, and picking each apart and saying, well, this data point isn't what it appears, if, I, if I'm correctly representing how, how you're, then if I'm, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, like, I want to well, get, go ahead, get ahead, ahead, ahead here, yeah. The, first of all, if you do step back, all these data points do actually kind of line up. And if you look at um, the pattern of Russian behavior over the past 10 or 15 years, that's why this time it feels like there's a, uh, an increased potential for it happening. Now look, I would say it's unlikely that they would launch a, a conventional strike uh, of some sort like they did when they went into Crimea 2014. But of course, I, you don't find too many people that predicted that they were going to do that either. Now, the, the water problem, of course, it's not new. But uh, what is new is the combination of factors, in my mind, of Kavkaz, U.S. elections, and a clear pattern of, of almost nonchalance, or at least not willing to do anything about it, by the West. Last week, you had a Ukrainian medic was killed going out to recover uh, the body of another uh, Ukrainian soldier who had been, uh, we weren't sure if he was dead or alive, but had been terribly wounded by an IED out in the area between Russian forces and Ukrainian forces. OSCE, both sides agreed that this uh, recovery party could go out there. So a medic walks out wearing clearly marked uh, red cross on a white background. And once they get out into the middle there, they're engaged by Russian and Russian led forces. This medic is killed. This is after everybody agreed that they could go out there. What, what has been the reaction from the West? Uh, and what kind of support does the OSCE get? Zero. You mentioned the submarines that pass through the uh, Turkish Straits. The, the submarines are allowed under Montreux to go through the straits, but it's only for the purpose of going to another port for uh, repairs or renovations, something like that. And of course, what the Russians are doing, these submarines pass uh, through the straits from the Black Sea into the Eastern Mediterranean, and then they conduct operations in the Mediterranean in support of what Russia is trying to do in Syria or in Libya. So that, that's where the violation part is, but because Turkey and the West uh, do not hold them accountable for these violations, they continue to do it. And that's why I think there's um, the heightened risk of them actually doing something. You know, all these vessels that sail in and out of uh, the ports of Crimea, I mean, technically, legally, that should be illegal because Russia's annexation was illegal. President Poroshenko, when he was in office, declared all the ports closed. So therefore, any vessel that sails in and out should be, is in violation. And yet, um, all, the, all of these violations are reported dutifully to the International Maritime Organization in London, which is loaded up with Russian officials, and absolutely nothing happens. So that's, when you ask me at the beginning, what's my concern? It's that the West is just not focused on it or is not gonna do anything about it. Now, you have, last point, you do have elections coming up in October, local elections in Ukraine. and. Uh, I think that the threat of force is one of the tools that the Kremlin uses, but you've also got um, potentially several local officials in this region that are uh, ethnic or pro-Kremlin, ethnic Russian or pro-Russian in their views. And so you can imagine in an election period uh, and with a, the right amount of grease and, and influence that there will be calls to let this water flow to help our brothers who are suffering down in Crimea. And you've got uh, local Cossack type uh, vigilante groups are starting to form in this region. So you could almost imagine a what would on the surface look like a grassroots effort to let the water flow. 
And then Ukrainian authorities have no choice but to either allow it to happen or to use force to go in and disperse it. And now you've got a whole other uh, problem that'll be exploited as well. So that's that's what I'm, my concern is. Michael, what Ben spells out, it, it is not something that's out outside the, 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 the normal Kremlin playbook. Um, it's a movie we've seen before. Um, we've seen it in, in various degrees of escalation from the, the Russians in Narva blocking the train tracks back in 93, something that came to nothing, of course, but it's, it's, it's certainly something within their playbook. Is, does, does this not look like a possible scenario, not necessarily a likely one, right? I mean, if you're talking about Russia mobilizing compatriot groups in Ukraine or actually exporting them to Ukraine and then mobilizing them right. in there uh, to, try to, to, to try to do this, which is a more accurate discussion of the playbook, right? Where sometimes first you bring people in by buses, right. then you say these people appear to be upset and protesting in their, their local, local local uh, groups. But um, look, that's certainly possible. And But that's, of course, quite different from a conversation of, Will there be a major conventional offensive to seize this entire canal or take your son or whatnot? These are slightly different scenarios we're discussing. Um, is that my possible? Yes. In my view, if you're going to ask me, do I believe that that's likely in this case? I think probably not. I think Ben has very good points um, on the fact that there needs to be much more attention paid to Black Sea and Black Sea security, right? In many ways, not only has I been taken off the ball on that, I just think that the security situation and the military balance in that region writ large had changed qualitatively over the last five, six years in a very dramatic fashion. Whereas in the Baltic region, it changed really by degrees, but much more attention was drawn to the Baltics. I think for reasons we all understand, right. it's kind of time to basically say, okay, that, led, that had yielded diminishing returns long ago. And there's this whole other situation taking place in the Black Sea that really does merit attention. I think those points are very good. Um, and there's a lot of things going on there. Not necessarily all of them are related to the question of Crimea, but they do all center and revolve around Russian military position, its activity, and how it relates to Russian military operations even outside the region. When you look at um, Crimea itself and, and the likelihood of, of uh, conventional operation, I'll tell you two things. One, honestly, what we're seeing in the Black Sea is what we would expect to be seeing in the run-up to Kafka's 2020, right? And you have to ask yourself a frank question. Nothing really exciting happened during Kafka's 2016. You have to recall that the water was blocked long ago. There were big fears in the summer of Kafka's 2016 running up to it. Not a whole lot of anything happened that September. You are going to see far more Russian activity, exercises, snap breaking checks right now taking place this summer because the center of the forces will be engaged in these activities, right? It will be the Black Sea Fleet. It will be Crimean uh, uh, Army Corps, and so on and so forth. And you also have a lot of U.S. and NATO activity, too, flying in there quite a bit as well. We've been pretty active lately. Um, and in that regard, you have to give us credit. Um, where does that all take me in terms of looking at the military posture? I don't see anything tremendously different in when we talk about Russian long-term plans for the military buildup, the expansion of force structure either around Ukraine or Crimea, but you know it's worth uh, it's worth having a conversation. What could happen during Kafkaz, or what are the things that we would look for? One of the things that's a good exercise to say is, look, here's a scenario. It may not be a likely scenario, but what are the kind of things that would make that true, right? If we were if we were thinking logically, and, and are we seeing those kind of things? So I, yeah, I think it's a merit worthy discussion. <laughs> Uh, Michael, I wanted to raise the issue of the land, the, the concept of the land bridge between Russia and Crimea, because a lot of the assumptions that some kind of conventional attack is imminent is predicated on that this is a, this is a long-standing strategic goal of Russia. And you seem to, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to be skeptical of the, the, the land bridge theory. Am I correct in that? Yeah, I always was from the very beginning, starting in 2014, where people were saying that Russia's going to build a land bridge to Crimea, and I said, that's deeply unlikely. Um, it, you're, first of all, as you know, I'm from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know, but Ukraine is really large. Okay? It's a very, very, very large country. About the size of France, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, it's actually, it's actually bigger to give a credit. So um, it's a pretty long trip uh, from, from Russia all the way down to Crimea. It's well over 300 kilometers of terrain you have to take with a number of cities in between. And if you want to build that corridor, it has to be a wide enough and defensible corridor, okay? And Russia was not very keen on even taking half, or less than half, really 
of the Donbass region, the manpower takes to essentially try to create a stabilized front along that line. And what you end up realizing again is you can't just take territory like that and own it because quickly you have to figure out where the electricity and the water and all these other things are going to come from. And before you know it, you're in for an adventure where you have to take a huge amount of real estate. You have to deploy a substantial amount of manpower, like field it, uh, fund it, whatnot. Um, and the, the, the entire thing can very quickly become a massive misadventure, right? I mean, that's the reality. That's the other part of it. Like, at the end of the day, and, and this obviously comes from my own belief that outside of Crimea, there's never been a strong Russian interest to end up paying for directly owning large parts of Ukraine. But this was always about controlling Ukraine's strategic orientation, right, and limiting Ukraine's sovereignty, not taking over and owning large parts of Ukraine and having to personally pay for them. Now, that's a contentious notion, and, um, and it, can, it can remain in dispute. So some people may think that, that that's not the case. But I, I never thought that this was a serious proposition. Okay, Ben, I want to give you, I know you're, I saw you're writing, Ben, so I know you have something to say here, but I also wanted to bring something else into the discussion, and something Michael raised is that we have, the U.S. and NATO have been kind of active in the Black Sea, but what also has been happening is Russia has been intercepting U.S. and NATO aircraft fairly regularly. I mean, I, this week, I, I kind of keep track of this. There were three cases of Russia intercepting U.S. aircraft. There were, there were two, uh, two Air Force, uh, two Air, Air Force uh, uh, planes and one, one naval plane. Um, the previous week, there was a U.S. reconnaissance plane intercepted over the Black Sea. Is, how, how normal is this? Or what we are seeing with these interceptions, how, how out of the realm of normal is this, Ben? The practice of intercepting, of course, is is not new. What seems to be a little bit different now is that uh, this generation of Russian pilots uh, and their Chinese counterparts, by the way, are uh, more aggressive, uh, less professional, which I think raises the risk. And um, the other part of this that is frustrating is that there should be so much international outcry over Russia's behavior, all these different violations that are always kind of in the margins, or it's, you know, it's, it's not horrible, but it's when you start adding them all together. Below uh, threshold, yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, the fact that nobody, the West together does not really do something about it. I mean, Germany is the one country in Europe that I think could actually influence criminal behavior, but you, you hear almost total silence out of Berlin. And I think that the United States, um, we make a mistake by kicking the Germans in the ass all the time. Instead, we should be working arm in arm with them to um, as really strong allies and partners in this because we need Germany to put pressure on the Kremlin. But the way we've been going about it the last few years has not worked. Now look, Michael is, is right. This, this is what I've described is an unlikely scenario. But again, I've not found anybody that predicted that the Russians would go into Crimea like they have and all the other things that they've done. And, and we want to keep it unlikely. So to me, this is a case study for how we can bring together all the elements of coalition power, uh, you know, NATO working with allies and, and partners in the region and, and trying to get the initiative in the Black Sea. You know, if, if Russia used uh, or practiced transparency for their exercises the way that NATO does. I mean, every exercise I was ever on, we had Russian inspectors, we had journalists, we had everybody crawling all over us. So, so the transparency by design lowered anxiety. But good luck trying to get observers to uh, Kafka's 2020, except for the one little uh, Potemkin village uh, demonstration that they'll invite the attaches to. That's it. And so um, if they were serious about, you know, wanting peace and security and being a responsible nation, they could be a lot more transparent. You know, what, what do we need to do about this? What should Ukraine be doing? What should NATO be doing? Uh, we need an unblinking eye over the region. And by that, I mean constant intelligence collection that, that fuses together not only NATO assets, but Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, They'll know more about what's happening here than we will ever know because of proximity, but also language and, and all the other informal networks. So we've got to get better at sharing intelligence and sharing information. I think that the idea of the land bridge, of course, uh, Michael's exactly right. That, that is a lot of territory, but they don't have to actually occupy it like in, you know, in, the, in the 20th or 19th century with 
uh, zillions of troops there. What they need is to be able to control Odessa, to be able to control the um, hair sun, uh, to be able to completely control Azov. If they wanted to seize this uh, canal, the, the 75 kilometers of canal that run from the, uh, the line of what Russia has occupied all the way up to the dam itself, uh, it would be a combination of amphibious operations in the Sea of Azov uh, and from the Black Sea on the west side of Crimean Peninsula, obviously helicopters, Spetsnaz, uh, cyber would be involved, shutting down, uh, disrupting uh, communications networks. And of course, there would be some other bright, shiny objects in other places so that Ukraine would be focused in lots of different directions. Now, uh, is this unlikely? Of course it's unlikely. It was also unlikely that the Japanese were going to bomb Pearl Harbor. I mean, you know, this, the history of warfare is full of adversaries uh, doing the unexpected when they think, when they think that the conditions are right. I worry about what's happening in the United States. I worry that we don't have leaders on either side uh, of our own uh, political process, um, taking more steps to calm people down, to say, hey, you have to respect the outcome, uh, refrain from violence. And I think that the Kremlin is gonna use every tool they have to ensure there is as much violence as possible in the United States in October and November, no matter which way the election comes out. And that creates a distraction uh, for us that will make it difficult for us to respond. I would agree. There's a lot to worry about here. And if you look at like, I mean, Michael, when you wrote that piece back in late 2018, that was in response to what? It was a response to the de facto annexation of the Sea of Azov, or what I call the de facto annexation of the Sea of Azov, because I really can't think of what else you would call it. But when you, when you have that data point, and that's a pretty damn big data point for me. And then when you look at the, the, the Russian buildup um, along, along the Ukrainian border and in Crimea, how do you view this? Is this, I mean, the Sea of Azov, is the buildup just a psyop? How do you see this? And has Ben right, as unlikely as this is, we need to be vigilant. We need, we, we need to make some moves and some adjustments to make sure that we don't have a, a security situation in the Black Sea that, 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 that's going to be much more costly down the road. Yeah, thanks, Brad. So let's talk about the buildup. Um, the buildup has been a long planned and announced uh, change in the Russian force structure and in posture, right, to essentially bring several divisions, brigades, and even create a new combined arms army on Ukraine borders, essentially positioning a fairly large grouping of Russian forces running all the way from north around to south, from Ukraine's border with Belarus and Russia, all the way down to uh, Rostov-on-Don region, the hub of sort of the southern military district. Um, and, a, of course, a modernization and expansion of the footprint in Crimea. Now, Crimea, of course, doesn't have much in terms of maneuver forces, really doesn't. It's about maybe Naval Infantry Brigade and, and an airborne battalion. But be that what it may, that's actually in some ways a positive because Crimea would have to be reinforced by the 58th Army across the bridge, across the strait, and you would at least get some indications and warnings. Now, ben, that's a good point. You know, when Kafkaz happens, um, you know, it's very likely you're going to see a force influx, right, from the southern military district into Crimea for the exercise, and then you have to keep pay attention and watch and see where they're actually going to go. You know, are they going to go to the ranges? Are they going to deploy? Where are they going to bring? The buildup is very steady. Russians are building out these very large divisions. Some of them are filled with regiments. Some of them are not. To me, there's nothing new there. I'll be perfectly honest, right? That's, that's, a, that's a word that's growing in progress. They're actually not cropping up with units that are new other than what's already been announced. The thing is it's taken them quite a bit of time to fill them. Those are pretty large potent forces. That's why I sort of opened up with a very frank assessment saying, look, here's the reality that as good as Ukraine's military might have gotten, right, the Russian military both in a qualitative sense and a sense of terms of capability and the quantity of forces deployed on Ukraine's borders has changed tremendously in the last six years, right, both in Crimea and around Ukraine, running all the way north to south now. So that's a real situation. That's why you do have to discuss in that. Um, but do I see anything you were saying there? No, not really. And I'll be, and, and I'll be honest, um, Brian, if you remember that episode in 2018, a lot of what happened there was in some ways a distraction because Ukraine got into a political crisis after the naval skirmish at the Sea of Azov. You remember it very well when um, those Ukrainian cutters got essentially attacked and, and captured. Uh, and then that led Poroshenko to impose a state of emergency. But that was a consequence of the Russian seizure of the Sea of Azov. Correct, right? correct, That's, right. Those are international waters. 
by law. Correct, correct, correct. So, but look, yes. So, but let's continue where the how the state of emergency happened. It basically was a resultant from that, right? And then began this whole conversation about Russian forces, kind of a justification for the state of emergency. Although the state of emergency, I mean, you could have debated the, the politics merits of it. The point being is that often the, the map of what's going on around Ukraine gets brought out, okay, for one reason or another, even though there's not a lot of there there or anything that's changing. Um, and so as always, you have to ask of what's likely going to happen different in Kafka 2020 than in Kafka 2016. Do we, have, do we have good reason to believe to expect something else to happen this time around? My guess is still probably no. Um, I'll tell you another prediction from some years back. I am not someone who, reg who always predicts that there will not be a Russian offensive. I wrote a piece, which was kind of annoying, in November of 2014. Um, I think it's for CNN. I can't remember exactly. Which basically said, is there going to be a Russian winter offensive? Because my thesis was that there would be, that the ceasefire wouldn't hold. And I had all these other people saying that there wouldn't be or Russians would wait until April of spring. And my thesis was basically actually there would be a Russian winter offensive going into 2015. So I don't get all of them right, but I, but I have gotten a couple right in the past. <laughs> yeah, you, you should have gotten credit for that. Maybe you're just a terrible writer, Michael. That's why nobody believed it. <laughs> I think that uh, th this is an opportunity for all of us to use it as a case study. And obviously, I hope that I am completely wrong. I mean, I hope that, you know, in uh, come January, people are laughing at Hodges, you, you know, you, you were dreaming <laughs> of the good old days, you know, and this was never going to happen, okay? But you do have to wonder, I mean, Michael laid out, uh, and it's publicly available, how many Russian forces are all in the Southern Military District along the border of Ukraine for, and, and on the border of Belarus? For what? I mean, are they saving it for a rainy day? Are they worried that Ukraine's going to invade or the Belarus? No, of course not. It, it, that's to have that much there. And, you know, President Putin, uh, the, his popularity is dropping like a rock. And so at some point, he is going to have to do something to, to turn that around. Um, and, and so, you know, the tried and true method of restoring the glory of, uh, of old Russia and, and uh, this, that's why I think these conditions kind of point to that. Now, we, we do need to watch uh, on Kavka's, uh, the, what goes in, you know, the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the way the Egyptians were able to surprise the Israelis and get this crossing over the Suez is because over the months leading up to the actual attack, they, were, they had trains going in and out, in and out for normal exercise. Okay, but what the Israelis didn't realize is that all the trains that were leaving were empty. So they were under the guise of an exercise were able to build up a large enough force that was then able to get across the, uh, the Suez Canal and uh, almost, almost a disastrous defeat for the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. That's why we need, we need this unblinking eye that combines all the different satellite imagery, signals intelligence, human intelligence, uh, sharing amongst the uh, littoral nations there so that we can know what the heck is going on. That is a perfect segue, Ben, um, and because I wanted to talk about Kavkaz 2020. It's only a couple of months away, and these exercises are always, um, they're always uh, like catnip for, for geeks like us, <laughs> and so we're going to be all over this. So in a few moments, we will continue our discussion and look at what to expect from Russia's upcoming Kavkaz 2020 military exercises. I would like to remind you, you are listening to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program at SEPA, and joining me from his hotel room in downtown Washington is retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, a 37-year veteran of the United States Army, the former commander of U.S. Army Europe, and currently the Persian chair in strategic studies at SEPA. And joining us from his undisclosed location in Virginia, where he's hiding out with his two dogs, Ivan and Finn, is military analyst Michael Kaufman, Director of Russian Studies at the CNA Corporation and a fellow at the Kennan Institute. I'd also like to remind you, you can subscribe to the Power Vertical Podcast on iTunes. You could read the Power Vertical blog and watch the vertical video at SEPA.org, and you can follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical.
12 years ago, the guns of August were preceded by the exercises of July, when Russia's Kavkaz 2008 military drills preceded its invasion of Georgia. Three years ago, fears that Russia's Zapid 2017 exercises would be a prelude to an occupation of Belarus or other military action turned out to be unfounded. In the end, Zapid 2017 ended up being a big, loud psyop. So with Russia's Kavkaz 2020 exercises on the horizon, just a couple of months away in September, and with tensions rising in the Black Sea, what should we expect? Michael, take it away. As always, this is a strategic command staff exercise, right? And they do one every year, rotating around between four regions. Um, and essentially, uh, you have one uh, military district, and that military district is in charge of the exercise for that year. This year, Kafka's obviously Southern Military District, both opposite Ukraine, uh, in charge of North Caucasus and uh, under in echelon and sort of uh, in charge of Crimea. So what you're going to have is one a whole bunch of forces um, moving out, practicing at training ranges across Southern Military District and in Crimea. And then you're also going to have in parallel with that because the exercise is strategic in nature. So it's not just about what happened in the Southern Military District. You'll have troop movements and exercise across all of Russia, and they'll be pretty sizable to take place every year. The job, ultimately, of the exercise is to stress test the system, right? It starts off with a sort of local war-type contingency, and then to stress it, and then to pose the proposition of what a large-scale war might look like resulting from that contingency, understanding that also, okay, Southern Military District commands what you might, from the Russian perspective, we would call the Southwest Strategic Direction. Western Military District just above is in charge of the Western strategic direction. Southern Military District, well, it has a whole chunk of, at least from the Russian perspective, the NATO front, right, the southern part of it. And it also has the Crimea contingency. There's the Russian fear that Crimea um, might be attacked, that Ukraine might try to take it back with U.S. or NATO support someday. And it has a bunch of local contingencies in North Caucasus and things like that. Plus, it's the main district that's in charge of supporting um, Russian forces in Syria. All right. What are you going to get at that? Well, I mean, ultimately, you're probably going to have a 10 day exercise. You'll have a lot of troop movements, a lot of exercises. You'll have very active Black Sea Fleet. In fact, you're going to have a spate of activity running up to it. Before the exercise, you're going to get a snap readiness check. It's probably going to happen a week before, where you're going to have lots of Russian units being put on alert, all the moving out. Um, and then you're going to have a whole bunch of activity in the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea Fleet. This year, I think, is going to be a little different. I actually, I actually suspect that the Russian general staff is challenged by the pandemic, and they're likely going to, one, curtail the military exercise in the North Caucasus and are going to push them more inland. Why? Because the, the situation with COVID in the North Caucasus is not good, right? I suspect that, that the exercise location is going to shift this year. Second, I also expect it's going to be a bit smaller than usual, and it's going to be smaller than planned. We will see. Um, we'll see. It depends. Uh, Mark, you, you, oh, go ahead. Did you want to, did you have another no, 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 no. I mean, there, you say this is a stress test, and I agree with you, but there, there are also geopolitical goals to these things, right? I mean, in, in Kafka's 2008, a lot of the troops just stayed behind and then participated in the invasion of Georgia, right? Um, in 2017, and actually, Ben, credit where credit's due, I remember talking to you back then, and you were, you were, everybody was counting, like, tanks and planes in the Zapad exercises, and Ben said, how many field hospitals they got out there? because you were looking at the logistics. And this is when the first time I ever heard you use that immortal quote of yours, amateurs do strategy, professionals do logistics, right? Um, how we listen to Michael, how are you, how are you approaching these? Do you, do you, do you think we have a, uh, you know, are, are you looking for a PSYOP? Are you looking for something more, more concrete in terms of military preparations, or is it just a stress test? So oh, uh, good analysis uh, by Michael. And I agree, I think it probably would end up being a little bit smaller than, uh, what was originally <clears throat> intended because of the impact of the COVID. I, I don't know for sure, but uh, there was a delay in the uh, conscription intake and, and their training and preparation. And of course, these big exercises that happen each year, you know, every fourth year there's a Kafkaz, there's a Zapad, or it moves around the four um, major military districts. Um, the year is full of steps leading up to the culminating event in the September of the year. So. Uh, for sure, there, there must have been some impact on, on their uh, preparatory exercises and, and, and doing those kind of things. Now, 
uh, there have been reports of significant hospital construction in the Southern Military District, more than would be needed just for dealing with the, with the pandemic. So uh, that, that was the first thing actually that got my attention about this year in, uh, in, in contrast to Zop in 2017, as a matter yes, of fact. Correct. Right? Uh, but what, it remains to be seen. And <clears throat> it is very important for large headquarters to actually do these things where you, where you have troops, ships, aircraft. You have to move stuff around. You, you can only do so much with simulations. You actually need to have the physical part. So even if they go reduced, uh, I am confident that the, uh, the general staff will still want to drive on with some degree of exercise for a whole variety of reasons, whether it's to rehearse things or to demonstrate. I mean, you're right. Part of these exercises, just like the Defender 20 that we did here in Europe this year, was about demonstrating capability to allies, but also to potential adversaries. Now, I do want to push back on something you said. Zapod was not just a big, loud psyop. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, it's a combination of things. First, Belarus played such an important role. I mean, Lukashenko, who will never be confused with Thomas Jefferson, uh, still was able to say, I mean, he, he demonstrated transparency that the Russians were not willing to do. And so the part, the official part of Zapod that happened in Belarus was in fact very small, uh, a very tiny exercise. But meanwhile, all the other parts of what in fact were Zapod involved close to 100,000 Russian troops. But because of the lack of transparency and their total unwillingness to, um, to talk about uh, or to invite uh, observers, they, they disregard their obligations under the Vienna documents for having people there. And so that's why I even heard senior German officials go like, see, it was all, it was all a big nothing. You guys were worried about something that didn't happen when in fact it actually did happen. Last point, I will say this. Um, General Scaparotti was the commander of U.S. European uh, Command at the time, and I remember we had the discussion about, okay, what should we be doing during Zapod? Is there, are there other steps we should take? And the decision was to do normal business, maintain normal levels of readiness, don't try to you know, man the ramparts uh, to create a provocative thing, but be professional. Do what professional militaries do, continue to train, maintain normal uh, surveillance, if you will. We made one adjustment, and that was uh, the timing of the rotational armor brigade combat team that comes in for nine months from the States into Europe. We shifted the uh, crossover uh, just a few weeks so that during the time of Zapod, we would actually have on the ground two armor brigades mm -hmm. instead of, of one. So that was the only sort of, uh, I don't know, extra precaution that we took uh, during the time. And who, who knows if, if that contributed, you know, how that contributed. No, this is, I mean, this actually raises something interesting I wanted to ask Michael, because we all, we're all looking at different things going into this. And like, I'm not a military analyst, I, I, I focus on politics. And what I was looking at during Zapad was the relationship between Russia and Belarus. To me, that was the most interesting takeaway of those exercises. It was more of a, re, the relations between Minsk and Moscow and, and Lukashenko and Putin. And there was a lot, to, a lot to take away from that. What are you looking at, Michael, as a, as a military analyst going into Kafka's 2020? What are you gonna keep your eye on? Because there's always variable in this. And what variables are you gonna be looking at? Are you, what, what, where, where do you think you might be surprised? Or what, what, what are the known unknowns that you wanna, you, you wanna get a better handle on? Uh. Right. I mean, the first honest, the honest answer to that is going to be pretty boring because as a middle, military analyst, the things I look at are not the things that excite most people because they tend to be very much down into the weeds, right? But be that what it may, um, you know, when you look at exercises like this, there's a tremendous amount of what's going on, both on the military end, right, in terms of what's happening with Russian forces, uh, both at tactical level, operational level, um, and strategic level. Sorry, I think, did you guys lose me there? No, okay, apologies, because my thing froze up and I thought y'all lost me. <laughs> no, you're fine, we got you. Okay, all right, well, I'll keep going. We'll put it back together. <laughs> so, um, from my perspective, the, the challenge with exercise and how we look at it and our expectations of what it means for Ukraine is, 
first and foremost, so Russia can preposition forces if it wants to invade Ukraine, and in fact, it has done that, although it has not done that in Crimea. So you have indications of warnings of forces moving to Crimea, right? Um, the exercise, the geopolitical exercise, the sort of signals Russia's ability and willingness to defend, and it's also, of course, meant to intimidate a country like Ukraine, to make clear to Ukraine that not only does Ukraine not have military options to retake the, the land that Russia occupies, but also that Russia has military options, right, to be able to invade Ukraine um, anytime it, it wants to because it has the forces uh, pre-deployed on the border. And it's meant to demonstrate to other countries in the region that the preeminent military power in that region is Russia. And we can debate that, but actually, you know what? It's probably true in some ways. In a lot of ways, it could, it could frankly be true. That's what I meant by there's a qualitative change in the military balance in the Black Sea region that's not taken place in the same manner or shape in the Baltic region, right? It's just not the same situation. That's a discomforting thought. Um, when we look at cases where, where Russia has invaded, you had a snap rate of check in February of 2014 that essentially uses a pretext and cover to move forces, right? Now, that tells us that, one, Russia can do that any time. It can use Kafka's for that, but it doesn't have to. It could do a snap rating of checks at any point in time, just declare one and move those forces around. In the case of Kafka's 2008, um, this is an interesting story, Brian. Uh, they show Russian military left two battalion tactical groups on the other side of the Roki Tunnel and artillery detachment preposition. A lot of the military had gone back to their bases from the exercises uh, within basically a couple days afterwards. That exercise was expressly a training for a contingency to deal with Georgia, and they had run it three years in a row because, God, no, I'm serious, they had been training for, for years in a row for that contingency. Now, they were not able to execute very well, but it was very obviously that, and they had very obviously left forces behind immediately after the exercise on the other side of the border. Now, in this case, there's both sort of the, the treasure of the fact that Russia doesn't have to do that, and the reason why it doesn't have to do that is because it has pre-deployed basically all the forces it needs already alongside Ukraine's borders, except, except in the area of Crimea. Um, and so one of the things you look for is what is the contingency that they are simulating that they're actually training for, both in the Black Sea and the Crimea, which units are activated, where are they moving, right? What does it look like they're training for? Right? Because the Zabat has a very clear contingency in it, right? It does. It, it's a response to a perceived attack by a coalition of NATO states, followed by a sustained counterattack that takes Russian forces to the Baltic states' border, and if you're lucky, only to status quo antebellum, right? But basically, these are work scenarios. So you're trying to figure out what the scenario is that they're working. Then you're trying to figure out what are the signals they're sending in terms of escalation, because they have a kind of a road to war story of how this whole thing escalates into a larger conflagration, because all these strategic exercises, Brian, they have one thing in common. They have to start with a local conflict and then they get big for it to be a real stress test of the Russian military. It has to go, it has to go south and become a large scale war. The thing has to expand. So basically you look and figure out what does then the Russian military do as part of that. And the most interesting part of it is um, what are the other military districts going to do to support the southern military district in its war, in the fight that it has to project in the southwest strategic direction. Who's involved in what? Anyway, these things interest me. They may not interest others. I know you're much. That was not boring, Michael. I, thought, I found <laughs> that fascinating. And I want, as we're bumping up against the end, I want to give Ben uh, a chance to A, respond to that. But also, there's something I want Ben also to pick up on something Michael said about the, the quality. You've said it several times in this program the qualitative change in the balance of power in the Black Sea region. And Ben, I know this is something that concerns you. You wrote a whole report about it for, 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 for SEPA last year. Um, and I know you're concerned about the whole, the whole military mobility piece as well. And so kind of broadening the aperture out, the, uh, out here as, as, you were, as you're responding to what Michael said, what can we do to address this qualitative change in the balance of power in this extremely strategically vital region, which represents a border between NATO and, and, and Russia. It's just a maritime border. Well, uh, let me start specifically with Ukraine and, and then step back from it uh, quickly. First, uh, I, I'm very proud that the United States has consistently supported Ukraine with training and, and equipment. And I was looking at some pictures earlier today, in fact, uh, which reminded me of a visit I had near Mariupol back about four years ago, and uh, I got to speak to one of the crews 
of the uh, counterfire radar that the United States had provided. And these guys were exhausted. I mean, they had been up all night long out doing the mission, but using this excellent counterfire radar, which helped detect incoming Russian artillery and uh, mortar fire, which saved lives. So um, it was that kind of equipment is significant when you have Ukrainians saying, sir, thank you, this saved lives of our soldiers. Now, the, uh, you know, we, we recently announced that uh, we're providing some uh, uh, Mark 16 uh, vessels to the Ukrainian Navy and the island class uh, vessels are being provided to the Ukrainian Navy. Uh, and that's good, but it's like two years before these Mark 16s actually will show up. So the process, we, we got the headline, but they don't have the vessels. So we've got to accelerate, I think, uh, get rid of all the problems that why it takes so long to deliver something that a nation which is at war needs. So that that's something that I think we can do, uh, but we can also help with, um, and I keep coming back to this intelligence sharing, you know, deterrence starts with speed of recognition. How Demonstrating that we can see what the other side is see, thinking about doing before they do it. And that's gonna require a much better job of intelligence sharing between NATO and non-NATO countries using all the different assets. That's I think that's something that we've got to do. now. Um, for our great alliance and for the United States, we have got to raise the priority of the Black Sea region. I mean, that, why, why are we having this discussion right now? Why do we care about a Russian exercise or a drought in Crimea? Because it's the Black Sea, and the Black Sea is so important to the Kremlin, which is why they illegally annex Crimea. It is their launching pad for all of their malign influence in Syria, Eastern Mediterranean, and in Libya. Without Without them being able to operate out of the Black Sea from Crimea, uh, Russia would not be able to support the Assad regime as they have for the past six years, uh, which has led to not only hundreds of thousands of people getting killed, but millions of refugees leaving Syria heading to Europe. This is only possible because of Russia operating out of the Black Sea. In effect, the Kremlin has weaponized refugees. The fact that there are millions of refugees was not an accident. That, that was an intended outcome. And we're about to see the same thing in Libya because of their support for General Haftar. You've got about a million Libyan refugees getting ready to paddle across the Mediterranean into Europe. So that's why Europe needs to wake up to the fact that we have to compete, contest, get the initiative in the Black Sea region. Don't allow them to operate uh, pretty much... Uh, unlimited except when the U.S. Navy shows up there. But it, the same the same four uh, frigates that the Navy has for all of Europe are the ones you'll see the cook will be in the Black Sea, then two weeks later it's up in the Barents Sea on another exercise. It's the same four ships. So our great Navy is stretched way too much to, uh, uh, to do what needs to be done there unless we can raise the priority. You know, Ben, I would, I would also add, and I know I, I suspect you'd agree with this because it's something we've talked about a lot, is we've got to get basically stronger anchors on the Black Sea. And this is where Georgia and Ukraine come in. Um, I view Georgia and Ukraine not as consumers of Western security, but as potential providers of Western yeah. security. Because when you look at that map of the Black Sea, we need those. It looks like a NATO lake at first glance until you start consi to consider, well, how good, of, you know, how reliable an ally is Turkey? How reliable an ally is Bulgaria, right? Romania is pretty damn solid. Um, but if you got, if you got, if you could add the Ukrainians and the Georgians who are dying to be like, you know, reliable allies, that, that changes the, 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 the map a little bit. And I think I, I, I view this as not, we have to protect these poor Ukrainians and Georgians and that these can be vital providers of security. For yeah, for sure. That's a great point. Georgia, there's a reason that the Kremlin did everything it could to kill the Anaklia port project because they don't want European countries uh, investing in Georgia, and then all of a sudden start paying attention to uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. That's that's part of the effort why getting uh, good in, uh, investment into the region, economic investment, would actually lead to improved security and stability. Georgia, by the way, is already a reliable uh, partner. Hundreds of, Ukra of Georgian soldiers go into Afghanistan nonstop. Now, you mentioned the map, and this will be my last point. Take on most NATO maps, the Black Sea and Turkey are at the bottom right-hand corner. So that's how people kind of think of it. But if you take the Black Sea and move it to the middle of the map, it completely changes how you look at the region. And it changes how we would value uh, Turkey as an ally, which has been a good ally since 1952. Um, but we've got to reshape the framework, the 
the framework of the relationship between the United States and Turkey. Uh, that didn't mean, I mean, I'm not excusing some terrible decisions they make, and they are difficult allies, but the alliance is so much better with Turkey than without Turkey. Uh, we've got to regain their trust uh, as well. Uh, and I think then we could start looking at the Black Sea the way Russia does, as an extension of the Mediterranean. All right, well, uh, we're, we're bumping up against the end here, but Michael, I want to give the last word to you before we wrap it up. Oh, I appreciate the last word. I think, I think Ben put it very well. We, we do need to pay much more attention to some of these other strategic exercises like Kafkaz, like Center. They do matter. Um, we do have a challenge in this region that we have either very uh, militarily capable allies with whom we don't have a great relationship, like Turkey, which is a thing we need to look at and fix, right? Or, right, or... Um, and, and it's, or we have allies who don't have great military capability that we can depend on, like Romania. Yeah, it's great that Romania is with us. That's fantastic. But it would, you know, but, but be that what it may, you also need to have countries with, with much better military capability um, if you want to change the military balance, if you want to have much stronger influence and presence in the region, right? So you're sort of, you're stuck with a much bigger challenge. There's a lot more work to be done there, in my point of view than the Baltic, and that's also in part because Baltic would be a victim of success, right? Because we've already done so much in the Baltics to reinforce deterrence. It's like, yeah, that's good because of the efforts we put in. Now let's look at this whole other situation down here. Um, and while, of course, I walk away still saying it, but I don't think necessarily a Russian invasion from Crimea is likely to seize the water channel or whatnot, I do think it's an important region and a lot of work needs to be done there. And Ben has some, some well-made points about the lack of Western attention, the lack of strategy, and most importantly, the lack of understanding of how this region plays into um, strategy writ large. Like, what is the U.S. imperative there? What is it that we ought to be doing? Um, and why is this region important for us? Uh, so I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, on that note, I'll, we'll wrap it up. I was expecting you two to argue more than you did today, but you tended to, tended to agree, which actually I consider to be a pretty damn good sign. That's all we have time for today. I'd like to remind you, you have been listening to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program here at SEPA. And joining me from his hotel room in downtown Washington has been retired U.S. Lieutenant General Ben Hodge, is a 37-year veteran of the United States Army, the former commander of U.S. Army Europe, and currently the Persian chair in strategic studies at SEPA. And joining us from an undisclosed location in Virginia where he's hiding out with his two very well-behaved dogs, Ivan and Finn, has been military analyst Michael Kaufman, director of Russian studies at the CNA Corporation and a fellow at the Kennan Institute. Thank you both for an enlightening discussion. I'd also like to thank our producer, Michal Harmata, in the virtual control room for keeping the lights on and all the complicated machines well-oiled and sanitized and in working order throughout our discussion. I'd also like to remind you, you could subscribe to the Power Vertical Podcast on iTunes. You can read the Power Vertical blog and watch the vertical video at SEPA.org. And you can follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical. Join us again next week when we will have a very special podcast marking the 80th anniversary of the Wells Declaration with our friends from Estonia Latvia and Lithuania. So until then, as always, I leave you with an ambient sound mix our producers have prepared for your enjoyment.